Hi everyone, so tonight I just want to give you more tools to understand your Bible. We spoke about the trees, alright, in detail now. You know what trees mean, represent what Jesus did at the cross for the trees, for his tree of life, he is the tree of life. So tonight I want to touch on a topic which I don't often speak about, that's the enemy. But I want to show you in this teaching how he is nothing. And we all know him as a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We spoke about him a couple of times in the last two teaching. We discussed before, uh, the previous teaching, this tree was Satan. It was not a literal tree in that sense, maybe. It was, it was Satan. All right? uh, and he represented a choice. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. They had to choose in. Okay, so remember, God commanded man not to eat of that tree. They could eat of any tree, but that one he said, you are not allowed to. Here is the verse, we've read it before, I'm reading it again. And the Lord God commanded, there you see it, commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you are, they may eat, freely eat. You see, uh, just more clarity for you. Every tree. So they were, we spoke about there were more than one tree at this stage. All right? Can you see Adam and Eve already had children here? When this... This is not to say this was said day one. That's not to say. Do you understand what I'm saying? They could have had children now. Or this could have spoken about... I also believe they were in the garden. There were trees that had fruit. That was also there. All right? They were in the garden. All right? So... Just that you can see how you must look at these things. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay, remember that. Die, die. You will die if you eat of that tree. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? So yes, sin entered. Nakedness, sin. You know by now, if you read nakedness in the Bible, it speaks about sin. Because it started in the garden. If you go look in your Bible, let the word explain the word. In the beginning, nakedness had to do with sin. When sin entered, they were naked. All right? Remember I said last time, the word must explain the word. There's two ways to read your Bible. I'm going to say it again. You must know this. The word must explain the word. So you must read something. You must go find it. It's, it's, it's match in the Bible, and it will explain. And then... The Holy Spirit can explain above those two things even more. But no, do you realize that none of those two, your mind plays a role. Your knowledge, your mind, your intellect plays no role in any of this. The Word explains for you the Word. And then He can take that and go deeper with that that He just explained to you out of the Word through the Spirit even more. All right, and most people don't understand that one. They don't even understand the first that the word explains the word. How do you explain to them that the Holy Spirit can give you something more that's not written in the word, but it's fully written in the word? You see, that that makes it extremely difficult. Example, like I told Ian, like it's in the Bible, but I'm just giving an example so you understand what I'm saying. Here's the rock. They had needed water in the desert. They hit the rock. Water came out of it. Here, Jesus, a thousand years comes and he walks and he says. I am the rock. Out of me, rivers of living water will flow. Immediately they knew he was speaking. He's saying he was a rock that gave water to Israel. Okay? So you're taking the word and the Holy Spirit showing you that rock is him and that's why he did this and that and he can add to it. All right? You understand what I'm saying? You can go deeper. The woman with blood flowing, she had issues. Remember what I said? So you can read why and all that in the Word, and the Word explains what's going on there, but then you can go deeper and you can say, if you have the issue of blood, you cannot be impregnated. So those that understand, if, you, if a woman has got blood, she cannot be impregnated. So if you have issues, you cannot be impregnated. You see how you take that and then the Spirit opens up and makes it deeper than just a normal Word explaining the Word. You go deeper with that same thing. And make it something totally different and even more beautiful. So there's two ways to read this stuff. Remember that. I said, yeah, what, what did God give us in the garden? What did he give us in the garden? I said, he gave us life. Why? Because there was only one tree that, they were, that was good and that was the tree of life. He gave us life. He actually gave us basically everything. 
that he had, he gave us in the, in the garden. Uh, what do most people believe or think today? When they get sick or a loved one dies, they say, how could God do this? This is God's fault or I'm sick because God is punishing me or whatever. But think of it, why would one that gave his life to us take our life? It doesn't make sense. In the Old Testament, it did happen because he didn't give his life yet. People died, God said, take away, and they took away. Remember? But here, even of his people, of his people, he took away when they did wrong. But then he came and he gave his life. Why would he take life again then, in that sense? I mean, he can do anything. He can take a life. I believe he's taken a life here and there that's necessary for whatever reason. I can't say what God can do and cannot do. But that's not his character to take life or to bring disease and illness and all that stuff. So we still today play the blame game like Adam and Eve. You know, when they got questioned, you know, Eve said my husband did it and my husband said yeah, Eve did it. The snake did it. She, she said the snake and he said my wife. Huh? We still do that today. We still do the blame game. What it actually shows you, when you st still talk like that, when you hear somebody still speak about, you know, God did this bad thing to me and about this thing and that thing, it actually just shows you their mindset. They're actually still in the mindset of the old Adam. Because remember, there were two Adams. The first Adam and the last Adam. Adam and Jesus. And if you talk like that, they know your mind is still in the old Adam, in the sin one. The one in the garden. And you're actually eating of the wrong tree when you talk like that. Because that's the fruit of the wrong tree when you speak like that. It comes from that fruit of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The snake's tree. I said, yeah, Adam ate of the wrong tree. And when he did that in Eve, that seed of that fruit, because fruit has got seed, that seed um, came by them being disobedient because they were commanded not to do this. Um, and that bad seed entered them. And they carried that bad seed, the snake's seed, into it. But I mean, the seed of God is good. It's called life. Jesus is life. But man ate of the wrong seed, the, the seed of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So when man ate of that seed, I said this before, the battle for the seed started on this planet Earth in the garden. And it rained till Jesus came. And the seed came forth. See, the enemy, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, couldn't stop it. The beginning, when they ate of him, he got them to eat it. He gave them that wrong seed. And he was hoping that seed will come forth. But he still didn't. Jesus came forth. The seed of life still came forth. You see, the enemy can't stop what the Lord is doing. But he, he's doing it at an angle. Where most believers don't even realize what he's doing. But the battle of seed started there. In Genesis 3.19, it says, In the sweat, we spoke about this, of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. All right? For out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, unto dust thou shalt return. They say that at most of the funerals. Stoff taught stoff, dust to dust. Huh? We say that. Now let's talk about that. How did we get to this dust thing? Yeah, Genesis 3. It's in the beginning. How did we get to this? It is this, yeah, it's a seed of the snake. Yeah, it was formed through that. The seed of the snake gave us that. Dust to dust. God didn't do that. That was not him giving us dust to dust. He didn't say, I'm going to make you from dust and then you're going to die to dust. He said this here. When sin entered us. Have you thought of that before? This is when, we, when sin came. We know by now, I spoke about it last time, sweat means sin or religious activities, your efforts, flesh. That's what sweat means. Remember I said Jesus, when he was sweating in the garden and his sweat became blood? Not your efforts, his blood saves you. Not your good deeds, what you do for him, his blood saves you. Today, still, lots of good meaning Christians still by sweating eat their bread. 
What am I saying? Today, lots of Christians still do works, man's way of doing things, to come to Jesus, the bread. If I do this in the church, if I do that more, if I pray more, if I'm in the worship band, if I go out on the streets more, if I, you know, whatever, then I'm going to be better off or whatever. But it's that sweat. If you do it for that reason, it's sweat. There's nothing wrong with doing those things, being in the praise and worship band or going out on the streets. It's when that, you think that's the thing that's going to make you fall in love more with the Lord or whatever the case may be. It's not. It's sweat. It's your own works that you're doing. You don't have to do those stuff to be in a relationship with Him. It is beautiful to do that if you are in a relationship. But unfortunately, most believers do that to get into a relationship and it can't get you in a relationship. I think most of us have seen that. A lot of people tried that. Where are they today? They went out on the streets for years. A lot of them still don't have a relationship. Why? Because it doesn't work like that. You don't get a relationship by sweating, by doing things for the Lord. It doesn't work like that. And I mean, this is one of the big problems in Christianity today. That's one of the big problems why other religions don't want to follow us. Is these things that doesn't look so kosher when they look at our religion, uh, other religions. We do things and we sweat. But it's not Jesus' way of doing things. It's not him that told us to do it. It's our own way. That's why we're sweating. But I, we spoke about it last time that sweat was taken away. We don't have to do things anymore that way. Uh, it looks good when we do these things. That's why a lot of people do these things in churches and religious institutes. It looks good, but there's no power. It's because it's not from him. A lot of people are teachers and preachers and pastors. It looks good, but he didn't appoint them. Otherwise, the Spirit, Jesus, didn't appoint them to do that. It looks good. They can even still do good. People can get saved through them, but it's still sweat. It's not God that told them to do that. And we so easily say, yeah, but it's still good. You know, it's still good things coming out of that. Yes, but that's not the point. We're supposed to listen to what the Spirit is saying and do as the Spirit guides us. That's man-made stuff. Uh, he took the sweat away um, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He showed the way, not through your sweat anymore, it's through his blood. His blood atones when his sweat was like blood. So what curse was placed upon Satan? So here this, God, this, this tree, this snake, this person, Satan, in the garden, when sin entered, there were consequences for him also when, when, when he did that, when he, he, when he allowed him to take and eat that lie. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, so yes, the Lord speaking to the serpent now, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. So here he gets cursed. And above every beast of the field upon thy... So please, he's not cursing, saying you're better than cattle. The animal cattle. He's talking spiritual language. It represents something. All these things he's mentioning here. He's not saying, listen, you snake, you are better than a cow. He's not talking about the literal animal. He's talking spirit language here. Genesis is a spiritual book. He's talking... Um, and above every beast of the field and upon thy belly shalt thou go. And dust shalt thou eat all the days of your life now. What does that mean? It says there, upon, got it here. Upon the belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of your life. What does that mean? I said to you, this was one of the things I asked the Lord when I just got saved. This thing bugged me when I read this the first time. It didn't make sense. When I was still a baby in the Lord, I mean, read this as if you didn't know much. Upon thy belly shall thou go, and dust shall thou eat all the days of your life. And then I'm thinking, well, I mean, a snake don't eat dust. What is he saying here? How can a snake eat dust? A snake eats rodents. So it's a Bible confusion. That's how I thought when I read this the first time and it bugged me. What is he saying? Because back then I didn't know what I knew now. So it, it, uh, uh, I thought uh, all snakes were the devil. Is that what he's saying? So snakes are evil. So every snake you see you must kill it because it's evil. It's the enemy. A lot of people believe that still today. Huh? So they see a snake, kill it because it's the enemy. You only kill a snake when it wants to kill you. Otherwise you don't kill a snake because he's not, made, he's not programmed to kill you. Who made a snake? Who made a crow? Who made an owl? Who made a wolf? What other animal do the uh, bat, do the Satanists use? 
we so scared of? Yeah, mosquito also. God made them. They've got a purpose in the ecosystem. They're beautifully made by God to function in the ecosystem. But we, because we are babies in the spirit, we read this and we think, oh no, all snakes are evil. And I, well, that's why I, I knew when I read this, it can't be. But what is it saying here? Um, what is the Bible saying? Snakes eat dust. Um, it made me confused and it made me ask questions. Um, now I, I can see, and like most of you can see now also, they might be saying this or it might be saying that. Because it's saying something here. Because this is the curse the enemy received. But you have to understand this because it's a spirit language to, to fully understand what it's saying here and what it's written here. Remember the snake is just pointing to the character of Satan. He's sneaky, conniving, backstabbing. That's his nature. It's saying, it's not snakes, snakes are evil. All right? But what is dust then? Because he's eating dust. What is dust? You. If you eat something, what do you do with it? You kill it. He says, on your belly you will eat dust. You will kill man. That's the only thing he, was, he, he wants to do because he, the seeds in man now, he seeds in man. Think of it. Satan had to sail on his belly and eat dust. Sail on his belly, it wasn't made easy for him. He can't run and eat dust. You have to sail on his belly. It's a bit more difficult. He didn't get free, free roaming because he allowed sin to enter. Do you see the difference? God could have said, listen now, run and you can eat dust. Because you've, you've got them where you want them. They're in sin. And he still said, no, 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 no. You're going to sail. It's like he did with Job also. You know, he gave him a chance. He said, no, you can sail and then you can eat the dust. So you've got to do something. So what happened at the garden there? Death entered. Because the Satan had the... The curse of Satan was he's allowed to kill now. Us, the ones carrying his seed. He, he can come and... Uh, he's capable of killing us if he wants to. Because it came through sin, that thing came in. Right. And obviously he said, listen, they can kill you. They can, in other words, stop you. He also said that. So now, just another interesting thing. Now in the rest of your Bible, in the New Testament, do you read, from dust to dust you will go. Have you thought of that? It was only said there in the garden when the curse came. From dust to dust you will go. It was never said, Jesus never said that. Why? We will talk about that next year. Because it's important to know that. But that's not what we're talking about now. But we know Christ, I mean Jesus, he brought us mercy. Let me read it for you, Romans 8. For the law of the spirit of life. In Christ Jesus, so the law of the Spirit of life, tree of life, Jesus, Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it, in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin. Free from the law of sin. When did the law of sin enter? In the garden. And it was amplified in the Old Testament with Moses' law. When they brought in the law. And it says, free from the law of sin and death. I'm going to read again. For the law of the spirit of life. Life, the, the tree of life. Whatever fruit it carried, whatever it represented. Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. It's two laws that it broke. Sin and death. For what the law could not do, the law of Moses and them could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. So it's saying the law was weak in the flesh. They made mistakes. They time they had to offer animals and all the sacrifices. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. 
See, like we say, if you see it in the Old Testament, you will see somewhere later he corrects it and brings correction. You see, yeah, he came in the fallen state, sinful state of man, made himself in that state to deal with the thing that happened in the garden. So he looked and acted like Adam looked and acted in the garden to bring correction in that exact way. He didn't make himself a super being. He was exactly like Adam and Eve in the garden, and he came and brought correction. It says he condemned, he came to condemn sin. That's what he came to do. So, Satan was now able to kill. As the Bible says, he can eat dust. But let's read this. I've told you about this before. Let's read this. Revelation 20, verse 1. Remember this one. You can use it a lot when people want to argue with you. I'm giving you something here that you can use when people want to, you know, go and say this and that. Why can't we heal people every day? And why are not everybody getting healed and all that stuff? Yeah, you can read them this. Revelation 20. Remember the verse. The first three verses of Revelation 20. And explain it to them. And it's not you saying it's the Bible saying. I think it's this and that. You can say here. And I saw an angel come down from heaven. Having the key of the bottomless pit. And a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon. Oh, can I draw on this thing? Who's a dragon? What's that? It's a tree. Can you see that's a tree? That's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He's got another name, the dragon, the evil one, Satan. It says, and this angel that came with the key had laid hold on the dragon. On this tree in the garden that brought in death and sin. We just read it. He brought in sin and death. The old serpent. There they even explain it to you. The old serpent of the garden. Which is the devil. Okay. So you see they give you all. So you can't say um, maybe it's meaning something else. And bound him a thousand years. Now the churches believe this is going to happen one day when the rapture happens. I'm saying I don't see it that way. Um, if I look at the Bible, let the Bible explain the Bible. I'm not talking deep spiritual explanation here. I'm talking about the, when the Bible explains the Bible, this happened already. It says the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. What does a thousand mean? One day. One day. What does that mean? A thousand, the number a thousand means perfection. Remember we spoke one day, a thousand years, and each segment is, a perf- is perfectly done. God said it was day and night, and he was happy with everything. It was perfect. It speaks about a perfect time, not a yearly time. It's perfection. So when it says here, and he laid hold of Satan and bound Satan for a perfect time. That's what it's saying there. Spiritual languages. Don't read the literal thousand. Because if the, if the dragon is a spiritual name, everything is spiritual in this book. So it's for a perfect time. This angel came down and bound Satan. For a perfect period of time. We don't know how long it is. That's not what it's about. It's about what it's standing for. Perfection. It says, verse 3, And cast him into the bottomless pit. The churches believe that's going to happen one day. I'm saying it already happened. And shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive thy nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. Now the churches say there's going to be a rapture, then there's going to be a thousand years of peace, and then there's going to be war because then that thousand years is going to be over. That's how the rapture theology works. And it says after that he must be loosed a little season. Now please, this is why I say the rapture theology doesn't make sense. How can Jesus do a perfect work on the cross, strip the enemy, then he can come back and fight? Because it says it, how they believe it, and he will be loosed a little season, so he's going to come back. They say it's going to be a, year, a thousand years of peace, and then the, Satan's going to come back and there's going to be the big war. Huh? You all have heard that? 
How can Jesus then, it means the cross wasn't the perfect work. Because the Bible says it was the perfect work at the cross. He took, he took care of all principalities and powers. Stripped them of everything. So if Jesus, we can still make mistakes, but did Jesus make mistakes? He never, everything he did was perfectly done. This happened in the three and a half years of Jesus when he walked the earth. That's the perfect time. That's why everybody Jesus prayed for got healed. Why? Because the devil was bound by the angel for that time. The devil couldn't touch anything Jesus touched. Because Jesus, when he came, and Jesus said no. Three times he came to Jesus to tempt him. And the last time, every time he said this, uh, can you do this and, this and this, and Jesus said, the word says this. The word. And the third time it says, and the devil had to walk away for a more, until a more opportune time. You don't read about the devil attacking him ever again until after the cross. He was, why after the cross? Because he was loosed a little for a little season after the cross. He's still loose today. We in that, this thing here must be loosed a little season. We are walking in that season now. So he's still loose. People get sick. Not everybody we pray for get healed because we're not in that perfect time anymore. That perfection time, that's why I always say, I've said it when we did kickstarts, you're not going to get everybody healed. And then the church system fights with me and say I'm wrong because the Bible says everybody must get healed by the stripes of Jesus. Because they don't understand times when Jesus and the Lord allowed stuff to happen. I mean, he allowed stuff to happen in the Old Testament in the law. If we think everything must just keep going, then that stuff should have been applied in the New Testament. But it's not because it was done there. It wasn't applied here again. That stuff happened there, and we can still pray, but because we don't know times, we want to apply it in a time period where it's not applicable. One day we're going to use it again. You understand? That shows you that that three and a half years, that's actually where the rapture people say the three and a half years of peace, you see. They see that as the three and a half years of peace, but it's not that. It's when Jesus walked the earth after... Jesus told him three times, no. Those three times is the temptations where the enemy started to do with him what he did with the first Adam in the garden, the questions he asked. You can do this. Same things he started with the first Adam. The enemy came with the same attack that he did with the first Adam. Like I said before, the enemy is sometimes a bit stupid. He came with the same attack, the wordings that he used with the first Adam for the second Adam, the last Adam. It's the last Adam. And Jesus was stood it. And when he was stood it, the enemy got bound. And he couldn't touch anything on this earth for three and a half years, for a perfect time, a thousand years. And that's why Jesus got everybody healed. Because nobody after that got everybody healed again. Paul walked in a supernatural walk. But he also still didn't get everybody healed. Because perfection stopped at the cross. It was fulfilled what he had to come and do. He didn't allow the enemy. I want to see the power he had. He didn't allow the enemy to come in and be an irritation in his work that he's doing to set his kingdom up. He bound him and put him to the side. said, no, I'm going to do my thing. The enemy couldn't do anything in that three and a half years. Nothing was Jesus. The enemy could just speak and look like he was behind Peter at one stage. But he couldn't do anything that Jesus touched, did nothing. Everybody got healed by the thousands. There's not enough paper in your Bible. Your Bible says that he did because there was no enemy. That should get you excited. It's going to happen with you one day and me if we become sons of God. When we become sons of God, he's going to be, again, we're going to get him bound again that he can't function anymore. That this season can come to an end. Must be loosed for a little season. So you see that verse? He was tied up. He couldn't do anything. And it says there that he couldn't deceive or do anything more till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, so after that perfect time, after the cross, because the cross was the perfect 
perfection. The most awful time in, 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 in humanity, the cross, was the perfect time in humanity. Because he did the perfect thing there. And when he did that, the enemy was loosened again and he's still walking around today for a little while because it's only a little while that he's got time to walk around now. All right. Do you understand this? That's why we don't get everybody healed because he's still walking around. He's got influence. He's talking to people, lying to them. But here Satan was bound for a thousand years for a perfect time for three and a half years. That perfect time. So what am I saying with all this explaining I've just done? To get you to understand this because this is something powerful you can use to show somebody and they're most probably still going to say you're lying it's not what it means but it's up to them to decide but why am i saying this to you in that three and a half years he couldn't eat dust you understand he couldn't kill he couldn't eat dust and then the cross came and all his power was taken away We don't see it in the fullness yet because it's still in that time period for that little season. And as this season gets less and less, the closer we get to all his power being taken away forever. But it's already done. We're walking it out. You must understand this and you must be able to explain this to people. It was taken away at the cross by God in the fullness of time. But in the time we are still walking it's slowly going away until it, he takes it away again when the sons of God is going to come forth. I'm not saying the enemy's power is going to be taken away when we are sons of God. In that journey, it's going to happen. We're still going to face him as we free the world of... Yeah, he's still going to be there. We're going to be like Jesus. Why are we going to be like Jesus? Because he's going to manifest himself in us like he did for three and a half years of the enemy, everything we say and speak, because he's saying and speaking it, will happen. Because he will not be able to touch. He will still function in the churches and everywhere. But he cannot come against what you do because you're doing what he's doing in you. Same like he did there for three and a half years. You understand that? It's something awesome to understand that actually and to really get that. Um, but he couldn't eat dust anymore for three and a half years. He was stripped away of eating dust in the time of Jesus. So Satan couldn't kill. Every miracle he did, everything he did was perfectly done. And like I said, the, uh, lose a little season, that's where we are now. We are living in that time now. So all the curses that Adam received was taken away by Jesus at the cross. He did that all before the cross. And at the cross, it's perfect. He's done it all. Everything that Adam fell for in the garden, he corrected it. The sweat that turned into blood, the sweat that came with the curse that God gave. The enemy could eat dust. At the cross, you cannot eat dust anymore. I stopped the curse of the dust. So it's not from dust to dust anymore, actually. You're not hearing what I'm saying. It's actually not dust to dust anymore. It was dealt with at the cross, but we are still dying. We'll talk about that next year. I said, as time goes, we see more and more of the finished work that Jesus proclaimed at the cross. We, we see it happening before us as he's revealing it to us. The, as time goes, he reveals his mysteries being opened. And we see how these things are being dealt with. Remember the enemy is stripped of all power and all dominion. He has no power, even though he's got some power still. And we can stand against that power that he's still got and stop it. But we're not going to always stop it perfectly because we're not walking in the perfect time. He's not chained. We can stop him here, but then he pulls his head out somewhere else again. And we can stop him there, then he's here again. He's still here. We just saw it with uh, four club. He's still, we're still in a battle here, but we don't give up. There will be a time that is all will stop. So, all the curses of man was taken at the cross. And I've been explaining to you for the last two sessions also. I showed you the curses. Every little detail that he did. The white cloth, the naked guy running. 
the tree that is, the fig tree that's being chopped off, that Jesus said, I'm going to kill you. Your time's over. Everything related to the garden, all the mistakes man made, Adam made, and I'm not blaming Adam, but all the mistakes they made, like I said, you and I would have done the same. He came as the last Adam. Why did he call himself the last Adam? Because he came to show the name Adam, what they, he did. That Adam person, I'm the last one to correct all of that. So that he stops getting all the fingers pointed to him. It's not his fault anymore. I, I will bring correction in that. That's why I'm the last Adam. So beautiful. He actually, I think he must have went to Adam in, in heaven and said, listen, I'm going to fix it for you. <laughs> because everybody's blaming you. Well, I'll, I will show them in detail, word for word in the Bible, that I'm going to fix everything that went wrong there. So you don't have to carry the blame anymore. But we still blame him today. And he's not to blame anymore because it was taken away. If you blame Adam today, you, are still, you still have the wrong seed in you. You're still eating from the wrong tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because Jesus took that all away. He took all those curses away. Remember we spoke about pregnancy, bearing children, the pain. It's not fully away yet with women giving birth, but it's happening here and there, women giving birth without pain. Monique had no pain with Lily, and she had barely any pain the second time also. Natural birth. But she walked in that, understood that curse was paid for. I'm not going to say it's going to work every time. But the more we pursue this stuff, the more we will walk in this stuff until the perfection comes. Because the Bible says the perfection will come. Why the perfection? Because it's talking about that perfect time. When he is the perfect one, the perfect time. He's everything that's perfect. I, I don't want to talk about all this time spraying out. I just want to say this. Even the woman... Look how he, the enemy attacked the woman. He said to her a couple of things, you know, with the child labor and all that stuff. What is the number one thing today that the women, saw, the women are attacked on? What's going on in the world? Abortions and stuff. Why abortions? Why is abortions so being attacked? Being trying to make legal abortions. Why? And they say, yeah, the enemy was just, yeah, but that's, that's not the answer. It's what's happening. But why? Why is the enemy so wanting to stop that? Well, why has he got such an issue? Because he knows God gave the woman the ability to bring life in the garden without paying anything. And he wants to stop that blessing that the woman is the only one that carries that. And he's trying everything in his power to stop that. And the woman don't realize it. Because they're carrying something unique that no other being carries. The, the God of the universe gave a woman the ability to create. He's the only one that could create before that. Have you thought of it? He's the only one that could create man, was God. But then he gave the woman's body the ability to create again. A human being. He used dust, and now he, you, your body can create what he could create in the garden. That's something massive, which the enemy can't do. And that's why he's got his sights on women. Why do you think women rights are so rampant today? Everything with a woman, the closer we get to the end times, the woman standing up in the wrong way. Because the enemy wants to stop what the woman represents, this gentleness, the softness, the reproducing. He wants to stop that. He wants the woman to be evil, actually, to kill the babies. And they're supposed to bring life to the babies, to the world. The enemy's trying to pollute the woman. Why is the woman the sexual object? It's everything to stop that seed. He doesn't want, because he lost the battle with the seed at the cross. So now he wants to bring influence and stuff in there. And that's the only way he can do it now. It's like that. To make you think you are something that you're not. Even men, look at men today. Have you noticed? If you're a man today, you are evil. If you're a white man, you're more evil. But even in just a man, you're evil because a woman is not evil. That's how society sees it today. Um, anything to do with a man is seen as, anything masculine is seen as toxic today. If a man does something, it's toxic. It doesn't get accepted by society anymore because men are evil. Why? Because the enemy wants to take the role of the man away that he, that God gave us. 
Everything is attacking what God gave the man and the woman. He's desperate and he's getting this time more than it's never been like this ever in the history of time that those two are being attacked in such a massive way as today. Why? Because things are happening. That's why I'm saying look at the wars. Things are happening. I'm not one, you know by now, I'm not one saying end times and all that stuff. I'm talking about things are shifting because things need to happen. The light will always shine in the darkness. Darkness will not prevail. If he, Jesus could bind the devil for three and a half years just to do his thing, you think he cannot do it now? Of course he can. But we need to be aware of what's going on around us so that we can spot what he's doing. All right? If, you're, you, if you've got a veil over your eyes, you will not see what's happening and you will miss stuff that's happening in our time. But the enemy is desperate because his kingdom is in danger. His kingdom is under fire. But there will always be a bride hearing the call to come up higher, closer, intimacy. Throughout the ages, there's always been a bride for a season, for that bride season, hearing the call to come up higher, to do what needs to be done in the season that they live in. The saints, the cloud of witnesses, they have done what they had to do when it was their time. We need to do, we don't need to do what they did. We must do what we must do in this time. All right? Not play with religious stuff. I said, yeah, what brings life to nature? Water. When it rains outside, what does the water do? It removes the dust, the dirt of things. Have you noticed it? If you want to do something, I said, yeah, when you spray water on a dirt road, they do that a lot. If there's a dirt road, they will spray trucks and spray water on it. Why do they do that? So that the dust doesn't come up, because dust will blind you. A dust storm, a sandstorm will blind you. Dust, the flesh, will also blind you if you walk in that. If you still walk in the flesh in dust, it will blind you. Matthew 10, 14, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of the house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Huh? Matthew 10. It's in Luke 10 also. Scary stuff when you school now, you know you will If they don't want to listen to you, shake the dust. We all know that verse. Is he talking about dust there? Is he just talking about dust in the literal? Yes. But what's the Spirit saying that sentence means? He's saying when you come across people, houses, we are a house, a city is a group of people. When you come to a person or a group of people who don't want to hear what you say or what you represent, shake the sin, the dust, the self, the flesh, the old Adam off. Don't get caught up with that stuff. Get it off your feet, your walk. Don't walk with that stuff and continue. That's what that verse is actually saying deeper. Don't get stuff in the, stuck in the fleshly stuff when they want to argue with you and all that stuff. The old Adam's way of thinking. Rather walk away from that stuff than argue with that stuff. Your walk must be clean. You see how you must look at those verses and see the Spirit? Because now you know what dust means. Now when you read about dust, you know it's talking about the sin, the flesh, the old Adam. Get it off you. Because we don't walk in that. The New Testament doesn't say from dust to dust. It says life and life abundantly. That's what the New Testament is saying. Nowhere dust, just life the whole time. The tree that brought in the dust in the garden does not get mentioned in the New Testament anymore like that. There's only one tree keep, keep, that's been mentioned over and over, and it's a tree of life. Life. Jesus says, I am life. I am light. I said we must not be controlled by the dust, the first Adam. We are, we are controlled by the spirit, the last Adam. We, we spoke about that before. It's, um, which Jesus is spirit giving, all right? Not dust, like the first Adam. So Satan, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that had the nature of the snake and had one plan in everything I spoke of now. Genesis 2.17 But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For the day thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. We know that verse now. Because remember, death entered and sin entered. Adam Eve. Now Paul is saying the following. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51. I'm only going to mention something here. I'm only going to mention something here. I'm not going to go in detail with this now. Next year. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. 
A what? A mystery. So nobody knew about this before. Who's speaking here? Paul. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Do you remember? I must say this now. You remember the garden? Peter that fell asleep every time, the guys fell asleep every time. And he said, do not be tempted. Do not let temptation come. I just realized that's why he said that, because just after that, they did fall for the temptation, the lie, like the first Adam did. He said he denied Jesus three times. That's why Jesus keeps on saying, don't get tempted. But you see here, that's why he said to them when they fell asleep, don't let temptation, let the tempter come and visit you. And he did. And Peter fell again for it. That's how we in the flesh struggle with sometimes stuff. But anyway, think about that on your own time. I just threw that out there. It's connected. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and shall be changed. For the corruptible must be must put on incorruption and the mortal must put on immortality. There's two things that happens here. The corruptible must be put on incorruption. That's one thing. Oh, that's a one. And the mortal must put on immortality. That's the second thing. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Where did this victory happen? At the cross. That's why I'm saying what has happened in Revelation 20, the perfect time will happen again. God is going to set his feet on this earth in you again. He's going to bound the enemy in everything you touch and do. The perfect time is going, going to come when Satan will finally have no power. None. Then the fullness of the cross that God spoke will be a reality. And not something that's still walking out. It will be fulfilled. And you will see he's got no more power. And why? Because Jesus is working in and through you as a believer. So basically, we're going to stop Satan from going after the dust that he wants desperately to get. And he's got no right to get it. It was taken away from him. But because man is in a fallen state, they don't realize it yet. And they still allow him to come for them. Because we don't walk in the fullness yet. But that's why we are the last generation. We are, there's a generation that's standing up now that's impregnated with the seed of the tree of life. They carry that seed in them. Do you realize most of Christians, without sounding too negative, I don't mean it as negative, carry the seed of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil still today? When they open their mouth, that's all you hear? That, that stuff? But there's a group that's going to come forth and they're going to have the seed that was given by Jesus because we eat of his fruit of that tree. Jesus chopped down the tree of the knowledge of good and evil at the cross. If you still eat of its fruit, if the tree's already cut off, it's actually rotten fruit you're eating. We're supposed to eat from the tree of life. And I want to end by saying this. At the cross, the seed that came through the Old Testament from the tree of life, what happened? The tree was standing there. At the cross, the tree of life, fully grown, the seed is standing there. And he gets crucified this tree and the tree dies because it said he must die a seed must die to bring forth life new seeds new plants so the tree of life comes to the cross in fulfillment and he dies and when he died he gave life to all of us because now there's many seeds but a seed can only give more seeds once it goes in the ground 
and dies. The Bible speaks about it. Jesus went where? In the ground, in the grave. But he didn't go dust to dust. He made it possible that there is now more seed. Because if you take a little seed and you plant it, you can get a big tree with lots of seeds on it. What's that big tree with lots of seeds? It's the body of Christ with him as the head. So that seed that came all the way through the Old Testament got nailed to a cross. And that was his plan. So that when that seed dies and it gets planted, it will die because the seed dies before it sprouts. And the tree can grow. And we are part of that tree now. But he had to die in order to do that. A, living, a seed cannot do anything unless it goes in the ground. And he did that. That's why there was a fight for the seed the whole the Old Testament through. Because the enemy didn't want that seed to fall in the ground and die. So I tried to stop at every point. All the curses, everything he brought was to stop that seed so that it doesn't die. And he thought at the cross, I've got him. If I can get him killed in a way where they do it this way, the seed won't die. I will just kill him. And he didn't realize when he died, the seed was planted. And it started after the cross, it started growing. And you are part of it now. We are the branches. We are the vine. Uh, branches of the vine connected to him. That's how, why he went to the cross. He had to plant that seed. The seed of life. He destroyed the seed of the knowledge of good and evil. It's only in the last Adam that it, that seed operated. Until Jesus came and he stopped that seed. And he specifically did everything that happened in the garden again. To show in detail how he stops. That seed that was planted in man. He stopped it forever. So stop talking in a way that we sound like we carry the old Adam seed. We carry Christ, the spirit giving, life giving seed in us now.